Next on the programme, to Sudan. The UN Security Council is due to discuss the conflict in the country today, this amid growing concerns about violence and about hunger. In particular, the United Nations is concerned about a siege around the city of Al Fasha, which is now in its eighth week, warning there that civilians are on the brink of famine. This report now by Charlotte Hughes. As the conflict in Sudan rages on for a second year, the country is grappling with a humanitarian crisis, with millions of residents struggling to find their next meal. Food is growing increasingly thin on the ground, and the price of the few supplies there are has rocketed. Officials have accused the warring sides, the Sudanese army and the paramilitary rapid support forces, of using control over food access as a weapon. On Tuesday, the head of the US Agency for International Development urged the two sides to protect civilians and called for the Sudanese army to open an aid route into Darfur. In Sudan, SAF and RSF obstruction of humanitarian assistance is driving historic levels of starvation. We need the SAF to open the Adra crossing, an essential aid route into Darfur, and for the RSF and the SAF to protect civilians and aid workers now. Both sides reject the accusations levelled against them. But as she announced $315 million in new US humanitarian aid for the country on Friday, Power warned that barely any assistance was reaching isolated communities. Her comments came as El Fasha, the capital of the North Darfur region and a former humanitarian hub, entered its second month under siege by the RSF. Clashes in the area are threatening water access for hundreds and thousands of civilians. Since the war broke out in April last year, some 14,000 people have been killed and more than 10 million displaced. According to officials, the country is facing the world's deadliest famine in 40 years. Well, to talk a bit more about what is happening in Sudan, I'm pleased now to welcome to the programme Mania Kingori, who is the East Africa Humanitarian Director at the NGO Care International. Welcome to you this afternoon, sir. Thanks for talking to us. And let's speak first of all about El Fasha itself, that city under siege now for about two months. What can you tell us about what life is like for the civilians who are stuck there? Thank you. And, um, you know, in conversations with civilians stuck in El Fasher, one of the words which they use to describe the situation in that city is hell. We've got uh, bombardment, artillery, uh, shells landing in town. Um, over 200 people reported killed in this uh, city, health facilities destroyed, people injured, and um, over 800,000 people fleeing from El Fasher. Many of them uh, moving southwards towards uh, Eastern Darfur. That's a journey of about 300 kilometers south in very extreme heats. Temperatures in these places can reach as high as 50 degrees Celsius. So it's, it's, it's really a harrowing experience for the civilian population in El Fasha. Absolutely. And for those civilians who are unable to leave, who are there, is there enough food for them, enough clean water? Are there medicines for those who've been injured in this fighting? It's, it's, it's a dire situation. Insufficient food, uh, I think right now, uh, Sudan uh, generally looking at uh, uh, close to 20 million people that are severely food insecure. And many of these, some of these are in this city of El Fasher. Uh, I, I, I mentioned the fact that health facilities have been destroyed, looted. So many women, especially ch women and children, are having to go through a very difficult situation in terms of access to health, facil uh, health facilities. Uh, you, you, you may imagine in a situation like these uh, professionals like doctors uh, are, have also fled. Uh, we've got very leanly staffed uh, health facilities with a few uh, medical medical uh, uh, staff uh, still still operating here. And the situation with water is also dire with uh, much of the public works uh, destroyed. Communities now having to resort to untreated water and there are ripple effects uh, when, when, when communities are, are, are accessing untreated water. So food, water, medical supplies, are some of the uh, basic, basic, basic uh, necessities that are hard to reach for the residents of, uh, of, of El Fasha who are under siege due to the ongoing conflict. 
And talk to us then about the humanitarian response. Is your NGO CARE able to operate at all within El Fasha or is it simply too dangerous now? CARE is operating uh, in Eastern Darfur. That's about, uh, it, it's in the next state out of uh, El Fasha. We've not managed to gain access to El Fasha, though we do have uh, partner agencies, local partner agencies that are based in El Fasha that we are able to communicate with. We are, however, able to respond to the needs of some of the 800,000 or so people that uh, have fled southwards towards Eastern Darfur. In that part of the country, we are running uh, mobile clinics, we are running health facilities um, in, 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 in partnership with uh, national um, non-governmental organizations that are providing much needed assistance to People that are arriving in really, uh, you know, you, you can tell that the people coming in are exhausted, they are hungry, they are traumatized, you know, uh, they don't have food. And many of them manage to, to flee El Fasher only with their clothes on their bodies and having to walk uh, almost 300 kilometers in extreme heat, they are arriving uh, sick and sore from that uh, harrowing experience. But care is there. We've been able to provide medical uh, assistance to those that are coming. We're able to provide water, uh, some of it uh, tracked uh, to, to the internally displaced populations, but we're also providing uh, psychosocial support to, to those coming in, especially to women and girls that have had to experience very harrowing experiences uh, in El Fasher, but also on the long trip to the Eastern Darfur. Yeah. As you say, for those civilians who've made it out of Al Fasha, clearly they're hungry, there isn't enough for people to eat. And this is a problem not just in that part of Darfur, but indeed across Sudan, we're told something like five million people in the country are suffering from extreme hunger. Can you shed some light as somebody who works for an aid organization, why food isn't reaching these people in enough numbers? Where's the block on bringing urgently needed support to these people? You have to remember that uh, to bring in urgently needed uh, food to these people, you have to navigate uh, various uh, checkpoints. You have to navigate uh, bureaucratic impediments that have been put in place specifically to ensure that uh, some of that food does not reach populations. Um, routes, roads are, are manned by armed groups that will not uh, probably let, that will not allow food to access particular uh, segments of the population. Uh, remember also that some of the places where we are responding are really remote with uh, very poor infrastructure. These are some of the impediments towards uh, accessing uh, communities. One of the other big, big reasons why we don't have uh, food reaching is because of the failure of the harvest or of the, of, the, of the harvest. We should be having a bumper harvest right now in Sudan at the height of the, uh, of the cropping season, but that has not happened. And just a final question for you. The United Nations Security Council met last week to talk about the situation in Sudan. They called for an end of the siege on El Fasha. Clearly, though, it's that siege still in place, humanitarian crisis very much still ongoing. The Security Council is meeting again today. What actually, tangibly, do you think the UN can do now? We hope that the UN uh, agrees, you know, is able to get both parties to the table to negotiate a long-lasting peace in Sudan that will allow uh, humanitarian actors to get to the places where assistance is most needed, um, primarily to the children and women that are hardest, uh, hardest hit by the effects of conflict in Sudan. That is really what we are praying will be an outcome of the talks today. Mania Kingori talking to us uh, from Care International. Great to speak to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.